I'm gonna download the new app and we'll get you started in the meantime. All right. If anyone could have told me how hard it would be to get to this point, I don't know that I, I would have done it. We both were working so many hours, knowing that you don't have any more to give, but you want to step up. 매일매일 실패합니다. 어, 스타트업의 생명인 것 같아요. I'm just not feeling it. Is it because we're black female founders with no tech background that we can't launch a business? I wish this innovation was everywhere. This is 100% what I believe I should be doing. But how do we actually make it happen? That cost of failure is so high. It's a lot of responsibility to have. Ashley Ammons and her mother, Carrie Schrader, mother-daughter team who founded this. As an entrepreneur, your first job is to find the place and the people that get you, feel you, support you, champion you, and go there and conquer. It's good to have a community, not just of people that believe in you, but people who are facing the same challenges. I don't think that I would have made it this far without the feeling of community that I found here. Women in my age group come up to me and say, you have inspired me to do what I've always wanted to do. You put another brick in the wall today, and that's kind of, that's what we're doing. It has pushed me to be not just a tech innovator, but a guiding light to other people. I had permission to dream. I don't think I had that. If I can help just one person, it's going to be worth it. But now at the prospect of, of doing this for hundreds, thousands, millions of people, there is nothing, nothing that can stop us. I got anecdotal evidence from founders in my shoes. I learn from each of them weekly. You can almost think of it as um, cloning myself 19 times um, to make 20 versions of myself and learning 20 times the lessons. We're thinking about what are best practices that I want to take into account as I think about scaling my business, running my team. Having that international perspective has really, really been um, just such a, a critical benefit of, of participating in this. Google's frameworks, especially using things like OKRs to help us remain accountable, has helped us to really navigate a challenging year where we've been hit with issues with our supply chain and trying to determine the right ways to solve it. We've been, been able to be introduced to a Google Cloud architect um, who has helped us to set up the framework for the cloud infrastructure that Deep Meta's API is going to be built on. I think 2020 has been the year of the pivot. And one thing I've learned is when you have a strong team, regardless of what their titles are, and you have a strong team unit, you can actually pivot and do anything. We had planned to launch a new product and we weren't actually able to do that because of COVID. So instead, we went back to the drawing board, we went back to our customer research and said, OK, what problem can we solve? You get new ways of tackling problems um, that you may have not come across before, uh, doing that much faster without having to actually waste time reinventing the wheel. And the best way to get as much value as you can from mentorship and from networking is to be really vulnerable, to be really open about what your challenges are, to, to have really transparent conversations and see where the conversation goes. Keep working as a bunch of bananas. Um, I mean, communicate, share with your other funders, with your team and with your mentors to find the best solution to, um, to survive in this so amazing uh, year. For me, uh, as I was my co-founder, I just approach any situation, any room that I walk into, any investment deal or client deal, as if there was there was no ceiling. And I think that's definitely been um, an effective mindset to have. Don't let the absence of capital be a barrier to you getting started because the world needs your ideas. Recognize that you have a new, unique perspective on the world, which very few other people have, by sheer being a black individual with ideas. And therefore, there's opportunity for you to bring something unique. And that trusting in that and believing in that is my number one tip. 
Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Google for Startups Immersion Black Funder Showcase. My name is Mariama Bumanjal and I'm the Startup Partner Manager based in London. Over the last 12 weeks, I had the privilege to work with 18 absolutely incredible and inspiring founders on their 11 businesses. But we would not be here today if it wasn't for the Google for Startups UK team who worked tirelessly to make this program a success. Thank you, Oliver Turnbull, Michael Kavanagh, Annika Henry, Andy Davis, Andy Watts, and thank you to our fantastic leader, Marta Krupinska. We just heard directly from the founders sharing with us what is important to them and what they've learned over the last 12 weeks, not only from each other, but most importantly, from an army of Googlers that we globally recruited to work with them directly on business critical challenges. Thank you to every Googler who joined this program. So today it's all about excellent, inspiring black founders. Uh, before we're going to hear from our founders themselves, we will be joined by Annika Henry and Andy Davis, who will share insights from the first ever Black Report. We will then conclude the showcase with an exciting, exclusive fire chat with two very successful founders. Our host today is Marta Krupinska, Google for, head of Google for Startups UK and three times founder herself. And now it is my pleasure to introduce MP Bim Afolami, supporter and advocate of Black Tech Entrepreneurship. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, I, I, I feel very humbled uh, being in front of you guys, having looked up and seen the work that you've done, the businesses that you've been successful in starting and founding and sort of reflecting on my own lack of entrepreneurial <laughs> success. Uh, I was a a corporate lawyer, then a banker, then I went into politics. So I think it's fair to say I've not take I've taken the easy route in comparison with what you guys are doing. So I just want to say that um, we need you uh, in politics. We spend a lot of time talking about entrepreneurship in a, as a in a sort of very abstract way, and seeing what you guys have achieved and will achieve in future really brings it home. Uh, and I want to do everything I can to help you work with you and work with all the your investors and your to-be investors to make sure that they see the value that you guys can bring. I think that underpinning, you know, underneath all of this is there's a lot of social and political tumult around race. And there has been over the last year or so. We'll all have slightly different views on how we address those things, how we deal with them. But there's something, and I want to finish with this, that I want everybody to be very clear about. The first, uh, and I forget who it was who in the video was saying this, there should be no ceiling. When you walk into a room, any conversation you have, there should be no ceiling on what you believe you can achieve. We need to make sure that people recognize your talent as founders and as entrepreneurs and as leaders first and foremost, whilst at the same time recognizing that there are often invisible barriers that you're facing that other people aren't. And I think that that's the thing that politics can help with. And I'd just like to finish by saying, do, do more of this stuff. I can't wait till we can do stuff in person. Do more of it. Show yourself. Uh, be as present and as visible as you can, because a big part of tackling some of the structural disadvantages in our society are um, the, the bulk of the public recognizing that black people, young black people will can and will and are being successful in tech, in starting businesses and in entrepreneurship. Uh, and they aren't just in sports, for example, or aren't just in sports or music. I think that's a really, really important psychological thing for the public. It's also important for, for children as well uh, in terms of role models. So uh, that's really what I wanted to say. You guys have got way more interesting, exciting people that, uh, that are going to talk to you. But I just want to say thank you very much for including me. And I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you so much, Bim, for, for these inspiring remarks. And, and thank you, Mariama, for your incredible welcome. Uh, and definitely thank you to you and to the team, uh, because everything that everyone will be seeing today uh, wouldn't have been possible without your incredible work. So Mariama, team, 
Bim, thank you so much for making this possible. Uh, my name is Marta Kopinska. I am excited to uh, be the host for today. I have the privilege of leading Google for Startups in the UK. And most recently, I've had the incredible privilege of working with some of the most ambitious, excellent entrepreneurs in Europe uh, that will be joining me here today on this virtual stage. Um, at Google for Startups, we enable startups to succeed by giving them access to the best of Google. And that's, that's our connections, our people, our best practices, our products. Um, and we're all about leveling the playing field because what we truly believe in is that if we want technology to work for everyone, it's got to be built by everyone. And sometimes we hear that diversity in tech is a pipeline problem, that there just aren't enough great founders of color or black founders or women founders. But if you joined our event last week, uh, the showcase uh, for our women founders, or if you're joining today, you will see that this is simply not true, that these founders are here, are excellent, and deserve their stories to be told. Um, for this program alone, uh, the Immersion Black Founders, we have received 155 excellent applications from across Europe and chose these 11 that you'll be hearing from today as the ones that we believe are really going to redefine the European tech scene and really solve some big problems with their technology. But we also know that uh, solutions to systemic issues uh, need to be holistic. So we didn't stop with this program. We know that it often starts with data and with empathy for those entrepreneurs. It's definitely super important for me as an ally to really get that empathy so we had the opportunity to partner with and sponsor the Black Report, and we'll be hearing from Anika and Andy, the co-authors, very shortly. Now, finally, the thing we did this year that I'm really happy with is in October, my great colleague, Rachel Palmer, and I had the pleasure of announcing of a Black Founders Fund that Google will be uh, investing or uh, non-equity um, investing $2 million into Black Founders based in Europe paired with um, up to $3 million in Google Ads and cloud credits. So we're really hoping that some of the issues that we're discussing here today, such as access to funding, that Google, I'm very proud that Google is making a contribution to these European founders as well. So I am so proud of the work. It really is a very emotional day for me. I think, I think what we're going to see today is, is proof of power of allyship and that all of us have a role to play as citizens, as employees, as leaders, and as organizations to make sure that as, as we also recover from this very hard year, that the world that we recover into is, is more inclusive and more equitable and better for all of us and not just a few of us. So without further ado, let's get going and let's start with the data and the insights about Black founders. And I am so thrilled to be joined by Anika Henry and Andy Davis, the co-authors of The Black Report. Andy, Anika, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. How are you doing? Good, good. Fine, thanks. How are you? Awesome. Good, good. Very excited. Awesome. So tell us, tell us what is the Black Report and what's the story behind it? Sure. So the Black Report is a qualitative deep dive on early stage Black founders in the UK, covering everything from how they were raised, where they grew up, how their companies came to be, why, and we touch on how it's going data-wise, looking at the, everything from their teams to their investors, their co-founders, and their sectors. Really and we've, cool. we've, we've deep dived so that we also cover their backgrounds and their parents. And actually what makes a black founder, it's so interesting for all founders everywhere to better understand the history of these founders, not only where their families are from, but also the structure of their homes. And when doing this, we worked with incredible black founders to get this done. And everyone along the way had to align with um, the work that was being done. And that's created a great bridge for us to partner with people with startups. And work with phenomenal people who understood the values of our founders, understood the values of the work we were doing and cared in an equal measure 
And um, it just enabled us to produce this phenomenal report that the whole ecosystem has taken well to. That's really amazing. And I'm so thrilled that actually a bunch of the founders that feature in your report are also now part of the Google for Startups and Merchant for Black Founders. Um, so uh, let's let's dive into the main findings. 43% um, of founders um, you've interviewed are solo founders, while the internet claims that you know it's so much better if you are building a business from somebody from the get with somebody from the get. Um, why, in your opinion, are solo founders more uh, more common among Black founders? Uh, why is that? Sure. So I find that a lot of black people, and I'm, I'm a good example. When you come to this country, we've had a few generations here um, from different places in the world. Um, I'm first generation and we've got a mixture in the black report. We find that when they come here, hardly anything is handed to those black founders. They have to go and get things themselves. So when they discover a problem, for example, they often can't afford the, the time to wait around to go and build to go and build certain relationships at certain points to get going and determine if this thing is going to be a success. They have no choice but to, as they have grown up, growing up a lot of them, we've seen 65% of the work, working class growing up, to go and just provide and go and solve those problems as they did at home. So, and I think that rings true with solopreneurs as well. They just discovered problems and they've gone to go solve it without waiting for other elements. Right? We've got a lot of them who have gone and got founders as well. And of course, and, and, and that, that's incredible because they built teams along the way and we look at how long they've known their co-founders and where they met them as well. And the interesting pieces are that that's always on their, a part of their early stage journey in life. And again, especially if you're first generation, you would have um, met them in your formative years. And it's, it's so interesting because you, you talk about not having things just handed to you as a black founder easily. And and another striking stat from the report is that only 22% of the founders had access to friends and family rounds. Well, we know that these are quite critical to the development of, of early stage ventures. Um, what, what does that mean in practice for the founders, this access to friends and family rounds? I think in my opinion, or from what I've seen, it can be a lot more challenging, obviously, for these founders to get off the ground and to start their businesses quickly. Um, when you factor in the other challenges they face with fundraising, it, it means a lot of great ideas never see the light of day or a lot of great businesses don't actually thrive or, or solve the problems that they're trying to solve because they don't have access to capital. Andy, do you want to add anything? Exactly that. I think that, I think that covers it a lot. And I, I just want to say it's a, um, it's a shame, 22%, right? Um, and I am highly confident and optimistic that number will change um, as our generation um, goes on to earn more capital than um, generations um, before us. And I think if we look at that and say there's, they, they raise an average of nine and a half K from friends and family, and that's a collection of people versus the 14 K they raised self-funding, 88% of them, 50% um, difference. That's a um, shame, and it just tells you and emphasizes how much they have to do themselves. Yeah, and it's also it's it's also one of the reasons why it's so exciting to be talking about the, the wealth generation opportunities that tech creates. Because hopefully, those founders that we're even seeing in your report or in our program today, they're going to go and you know build big businesses, hire a lot of people. Everybody is going to become wealthier as a result, and then those friends and family around. Um, for by founders in the future will be will be increasing. But let's let's continue talking about um, access to funding. Um, seventy seven percent of startups you surveyed are already generating revenue for a pre seed startup. That's incredible. <laughs> and at the same time, they uh, raised on average one hundred sixty six thousand pounds. I'm not saying it's very little, but let's also face it, it's not a lot. So. Mm -hmm. What are the changes you'd like to see in the angel space, in the VC ecosystem to increase that access to capital uh, for black founders? I would start with more representation. And I think that's not just in the ecosystem in terms of angels and VCs. I think that's also in big tech that's across the board. Um, we can't create solutions for everybody if there's only a couple of people sitting at the table. So for me, it's 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 swathes of society have to represent the society that's actually governing. And that, that has to change soon and quickly, ideally. Um, but that would be the big change for me, representation. Yeah. 
So both in terms of having more black people in VCs um, and then hopefully more program, more reports like yours and, and more programs like, like this one. And hopefully I know we had about 60 investors joining for this event. So I hope you're all watching and I hope you've got your checkbooks ready. Uh, because These are some of the most brilliant people I've had the privilege to work with. Um, yeah. Andy, do you have anything to add on that? No, um, just exactly on those last two points, um, agreed 100%. Yeah, awesome. Um, uh, something else that's really f fantastic is um, we see that black founders are excellent job creators. Um, the ones that you interviewed um, employed on average five and a half person. Um, and again, let's remember, these are early stage companies already generating revenue who haven't had uh, that much capital raised. Um, What's really exciting is that almost half of these employees are women and also that the, the, the teams were ethnically diverse as well. So would you go as far as saying that, that us as an ecosystem investing more in black leaders might also lead to more overall diversity in tech, which we know is a big challenge? Definitely, yes. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I think... Um... And it's, it's everywhere. We look at co-founder relationships and break down there structurally, founding teams, and even the investors touching the last point. To have have investors 25% being women, right, are the investors they're putting capital into, into these companies. We've got a third black found black investors in these founders. And then we've got 38%, which are people of color. And I think that tells you more than enough, right? Like when, when there's people are in positions that they can back founders. They're going to do it. Um, they're, they're going to do it quite equally as well, and do a great job of it. And there won't be um, biases or obstacles in the way, and be so called obstacles. They're going to just they're going to just make the best decision possible, and that's what hopefully everyone's going to do today here as well. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, thank you. So I guess there's one other thing on everyone's mind today. Um, I've I've seen you working tirelessly on this report, uh, days and nights, especially nights, um, from what I've heard and seen. Will there be the next black report? Yeah, I think there has to be. There will be. Um, next year will be bigger. Um, it will be respectfully better in the sense that the um, what we what we talk about with the founders will be um, deeper and um, varied, varied geographically, um, varied stage wise, and um, we're just going to keep serving the ecosystem ultimately and improving things all funds for black founders well as far as i'm concerned you guys are incredibly humble because uh you know you're saying bigger and better but what i've seen is the first of its kind real deep dive into the experiences of, of of black founders and i think for for all of us definitely for me personally as somebody who takes allyship really really to my heart i, I think you've done an incredible piece of work so congratulations to both of you andy david and Eva henry co-authors of the black report Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks for joining me today. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. Well, I hope you are all very well warmed up because uh, this was just the most brilliant start to now hear from the incredible 11 startups that we've been working with in our Google for Startups Black um, Founders Immersion program. Uh, you saw some snippets of them already uh, in the video at the beginning, but here come the pitches. Now, I know that we've had a whopping like 600 people um, register for this event, and I know that all of you are burning with questions that you would like to ask our founders. So below the below the video screen you will see the chat box or the q a box feel free to use it because after each pitch we're going to have a little bit of time for a question to the founders and it might just be that your question will be the one that gets asked and then um, if you don't get a live answer then also we'll be encouraging the founders to check these questions later and get back to you especially if you're an investor uh, and i know that we have a lot of those watching uh, please use that option so Without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce the founders of Afrocentrics, who will be the first ones to present today. Ladies, take it away. At Afrocentrics, we formulate natural hair care products for Afro and curly hair. We're a vertically integrated D2C brand, and that means that we formulate, manufacture, and sell directly to our customers. Me and Joyce met at university 10 years ago, we bonded over our shared hair problems 
and we started to experiment with natural ingredients that would solve the problems without upsetting my eczema. Today, we've sold over 28,000 bottles to customers in the UK and around the world. Our main customers are black women because they're neglected by the industry. Seven in 10 black women aren't actually catered to on the high street. And we have the solution. Our award-winning scientifically formulated products solve common problems such as dryness and breakage. We've been featured in Vogue magazine, Indie Best and Glamour Mag to name a few. And we're offering these safe, effective solutions that customers, influencers and celebrities all love. So what is it that makes us different? Well, it's three key things. Firstly, ethics and sustainability are in our DNA as a company. We actually registered at university because we won a competition for ethical and sustainable business innovation. The second thing is our obsession with data and the fact that we talk to our customers every single day to make sure that the data that we collect is properly understood in its true context. And the third and final thing, possibly one of the most important, is that we can get our products to market faster than industry standard. So our competitors take two to 10 years, but with proper resources, we can do it in six to 12 months. 3.2 billion people in the world have Afro and curly hair, and that number is growing. When it comes to Afro hair, there's also a huge cultural importance that's often overlooked in the industry. And this means that black women tend to spend six times more on their hair than their white counterparts. This huge underserved market presents a fantastic opportunity for people who truly understand it, and we do. And the massive changes in the industry recently. At the bottom of this quadrant, you see that the toxic side is full of competition. However, it's losing popularity. And major exits have started to happen on the wholesale side. We've seen sheer moisture sell to Unilever, Carol's daughter to L'Oreal, form to Procter & Gamble. And Afrocentrics is leading in the most exciting quadrant because we're going D2C with safe and effective products. And some activity and investment has already begun there, but we're ready to lead the market. We've made great progress so far. We have 82% margins online and 40 to 60% margins through retail. And 90% of our sales are online at the moment. Our CAC is 12 pounds and our average basket spend is 45 pounds. So we're recovering our costs in that first spend. And we have a raw lifetime value of 712 pounds. A year and a half ago, we used to make six grand in a really, really good month. This year, we've averaged 40 to 50,000 pounds every single month. So this is really our tipping point. We attract top talent and our pre-seed round allowed us to hire a team for the very first time about a year and a half ago and to go full time ourselves. Our team has a deep understanding of the market and we only hire people who care deeply about the health and well-being of our customers as much as me and Joycelyn do. And that means that our world-class team are ready and motivated to deliver excellent growth. So right now we're raising a seed round. This seed round is all about the journey to series A and with our series A round, we're going to go full steam ahead into international expansion. But for now, our aim is to win in the UK. And in order to do this, we need to hire some people. So we're hiring a developer, an R&D chemist, a customer care lead and a digital marketer. And we already have a lead investor for this round, but there is still space. So do get in touch if you're an investor, who wants to be in one of the most exciting, fast growing startups in an industry that is massively misunderstood and underserved. Thank you all for listening. That was just absolutely fantastic. And it looks like your, uh, your customers and your fans are watching this because we've got a question um, from Miss Sophie who says she loves Afrocentrics. Um, and her question is, how do you recruit the right team as a startup? And also, how do you deal with staff who don't have the right mindset for a startup? So the way that we recruit the right team is through using our networks. We recruit based on purpose. So we're very keen on the of making sure that whoever wants to work at Afrocentrics understands the long-term vision and cares about our community. If that person is not the right fit, we have a mindset that we hire slow and we fire fast. If we can see that they don't really care about the customers, they don't care about the vision, they're not in it to build the best Afro hair brand, then they're not the right person for Afrocentrics. We're very protective of our team. That's that's awesome. That sounds fantastic. So investors invest, um, potential candidates go and work for these incredible entrepreneurs. Um, Rachel, there you go, as you said. <laughs> Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, congratulations on your amazing business. Um, thank you. Thank you.
And over to a very different industry, but equally exciting, um, welcoming the founders of AudioMob. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christian. I'm the founder of AudioMob. And what we provide is non-intrusive audio ads within mobile games. And in terms of the core team, I'm the founder and CEO. I was a strategist at Google and a marketing science partner at Facebook. And I've developed my own games on my own hip-hop and jazz music, which got us looking into uh, the audio opportunities in the mobile space. And with me, my CTO and co-founder, Paul. Hey, uh, my name is Wilfred. Um, thanks for the intro, Christian. Um, so I was a um, account programmatic account strategist at Google, um, what used to work in the Google Cloud team, and also um, as a customer solutions engineer. Um, previously to that, I was at Goldman Sachs. In terms of the problem we're solving, uh, as the video starts, you'll see the status quo is that games are blocked by videos and they really annoy players. It causes a churn in retention. Now, the main opportunity here is that we can absolutely stream a uh, number of audio ads within within the uh, within the mobile gaming space. Uh, if you just go to the uh, the next slide, um, the the, the uh, publishing space such as uh, Spotify, you know, you've got one to two ads that are streamed per minute by the typical user. Because if you take a free user, uh, they might listen to an ad every couple of minutes in between a music track. But then when you've got gaming inventory, you know, the, the opportunity is a hundred times larger because at any one time a player might die or they might request a power up. So the gaming opportunity is huge and the reach is substantial. There's over 2.7 billion gamers in this market is growing at 35% a year. And we're talking about premium inventory here. The likes of Quale, uh, Voodoo, these are, these are potentially hundreds of billions of, uh, of impressions of streams that have been uh, untapped. And I'm gonna hand it over to Wilfred to go over the solution. Yeah, thanks, Christian. So um, as you can see, uh, here's one of our format breakdowns of our Unity plugin. Um, the idea is it's non-interrupting. So you're, as Christian mentioned, um, unlike a rewarded video, we're not blocking the user. It's clickable, uh, but tracking quartiles is also addressable because we pass back device ID. Um, and if the user mutes, we also have an unmute prompt. Um, and then going on to our second integration uh, method in the DSP overview is we also allow um, advertisers to create campaigns on our platform and serve their audio ads into pre-existing SDKs. And this is done through our DSP. And as you can see, those are some of our um, targeting options. Um, and I just want to bring your attention to our Warner case study. Um, and so in our Warner case study, so this is, um, if you just hit play, yeah, perfect. Um, so as that loads up, um, what you're seeing on the left-hand side is um, our, uh, what you should be hearing is um, uh, Joel Corey, who's a Warner artist, um, who is now being played at the same time as someone playing the game. The main things to take away here are that we had a 1,000% increase in CTR in comparison to the traditional banner ads. And we also saw a, a very, very low bounce rate um, on the destination page, which was a link to all of our various, all of the various streaming platforms. Um, so I'll hand back to Christian just to talk about uh, traction. Thanks, Wilfred. So as a company, we've raised $1.5 million. We've announced that recently. And in terms of the ask, you know, as Wilfred mentioned, we have a thousand percent increase in CTR. And uh, what, what we are, what we're asking for is more introductions to, uh, to brands. Uh, we're already testing with Warner, Amazon, McDonald's. And we really have a game changing product here. So if you know any brands that our technology might help, then feel free to uh, pass them along to us. Thank you. Christian Wilfred, that was incredible. And congrats on the raise. You are you are the proof that when you've got an incredible business, um, you are very well capable of, of getting that money. So I've got a question. I'm sure that all the advertisers um, watching got very excited, definitely the gamers too. Um, would you say there are any particular brands that this format of ads is working well for, or is it more down to the creative? Uh, what was your thought on that? Because we can access so many different players, I mean, we can access over a billion players now, it's any kind of brand that is looking to reach a specific user. So this could be McDonald's, we're testing with health clinics, the music industry. So anyone that has you know, a brand budget and looking to access uh, users in general, uh, we definitely have the, uh, the facilities to target them. All right. 
That's fantastic. Um, well, then advertisers, you know what to do. Um, Christian, Wilfred, congratulations on your amazing business and thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Thanks. Cheers. All right, now we're going to the Netherlands and we'll be hearing from Christina, the uh, co-founder of Authius. Hi, my name is Christina Collier and I'm the co-founder of Authios. Authios is a video intelligence platform helping brands to measure, improve, and personalize their video marketing towards consumers. Particularly during this global health crisis, consumers are shopping more and more online and video becomes even more core to digital marketing strategy for brands. But most are still flying blind when it comes to performance. Some of the key challenges that marketeers face are that they lack the tools to measure video impact, especially from a commercial perspective. They don't necessarily have the expertise to interpret any sort of performance numbers that they're able to glean. And lastly, they just don't have the time to translate those learnings into changes in their marketing strategy. Enter Authios, which is automatically improving and per in per uh, personalizing the digital consumer experience through video. So what is a video intelligence platform? Well, the foundational piece is our specialized video dam, which is used by brands to store, organize, and automatically publish their videos to their own consumer sites and to their reseller sites. Just a few lines of JavaScript code that integrates their consumer sites with the Authios platform so they can stream videos directly from our database. And via this embed code and our video player, Authios is able to measure consumer behaviors on site. We've so far been able to collect hundreds of billions of data points, which fuel our proprietary performance models. Insights are reported back to brands on either an individual video, a product, or a category basis. So brands know where to invest in video and where not to. Taking those learnings, Authios is applying both machine learning predictive models and rules-based logic models to determine which video would be most relevant to show at that moment. So we're contextually personalizing the video experience for consumers based on things like marketing campaign or social media channel referrals, page context, device type, and of course, KPI performance. In terms of some value creation for our clients, Philips is an example of a client that wanted to focus on boosting conversion. So on their consumer site, our video algorithm was calibrated to optimize for add to cart conversions. We were able to achieve an almost 600% increase in conversion for their coffee category. But Avancia was more focused on optimizing their operational efficiencies. So by using Authios as an automatic publishing tool, they reduced their time spent to publish each video across their regional sites by 90%, from 30 minutes down to five. And overall, the global trends in e-commerce and video ad spend are both in steep trajectories of growth. And these are, of course, both favorable to Authios and for the demand of our product. And in terms of where we would love your help, intros. Help us to tackle our international expansion. Though we have international clients like Procter & Gamble, Nintendo, and Microsoft, we're currently focused in the Benelux region, and we're looking to expand into regions like the UK, the Nordics, and of course, the US. Thanks in advance for any help you can offer. And of course, thank you for listening. Thank you, Christina. Really exciting. And I've got a question for you about personal branding. So you have been very visible um, in the press. You got a number of fabulous awards. Um, and you have really, you know, first of all, you're an incredible inspiration to other entrepreneurs. Um, but second of all, this is obviously fantastic for a company. What tips would you have for other entrepreneurs on achieving the success that, that you've achieved? Well, I, I think, you know, um, one thing that has really helped me um, is, is network, obviously. So that, that was a little bit easier before the pandemic happened. But um, always being, you know, reaching out and trying to talk to people about the stuff that I love, uh, which is Authios and, um, you know, just marketing trends in general. Um, and in particular, certain things that were really discussed in the Black Report, so around access um, and visibility to uh, underrepresented founders. So 
Um, I think if you're if you're able to speak passionately about things with a big group of people, that's going to also allow you to be able to just you know sort of tailor your uh, story and um, and to be able to bring out those salient points that are going to be really interesting. And um, and of course, these introductions, as people know your name, they're going to start recommending you on certain topics that you can speak about. Um, and as you get a little bit more influence into certain topics, then those, uh, in some cases, those journalists might reach out to you. Um, but in other cases, you can put together a sort of uh, proposal on uh, a story and just make sure that that pr proposal is um, hitting all the right notes in terms of being relevant to um, to the audience of the publication that you're trying to get published into, and also make sure that with the um, with the the publisher or the editor that you're creating that relationship with, that there's also something that they see is going to be super super interesting and exciting and perhaps exclusive uh, to their readers. Yeah, it sounds incredible. Thanks so much for joining us today. Congrats of every on everything that you do. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Marta. All right, brilliant. And we're back to the UK and we'll be hearing from Tamita, the co-founder and CEO of CircuitMind. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tamita, and at CircuitMind, we're bu building AI that fully automates the design of electronic circuit boards. Now, let me give you a number. 1.5 billion hours. That's the amount of hours that have elapsed since humans first appeared on this earth. It's also the amount of hours that engineers spend designing circuit boards every single year. That 1.5 billion hours translates to 40 billion pounds in global expenditure. Now I know what you're thinking. That's ridiculous. But maybe it's not so surprising since circuit boards are at the core of everything from the mobile phones in your pockets to the autonomous vehicles that will drive us in the future. But what if I told you that we could cut that cost and time spent down by 90%? We spoke to Austin, an engineer who spent one and a half mind-numbing years building a circuit board for a car. It took him so long because he had to choose hundreds of electronics parts, searching through millions of parts online. Next, he had to perform tedious manual calculations, extracting information from convoluted data sheets while deciding how hundreds of these parts will fit together to form the perfect circuit that functions as he needs. Finally, he had to position these parts in a tight space connecting them in a complex three-dimensional maze, choosing one from an infinite number of arrangements. It took him one and a half years. For engineers everywhere, this is a horrendously painful endeavor, and we are fixing this. We are completely automating the design of electronic circuit boards. Our intelligent software takes in as inputs the top-level requirements of a circuit board and outputs the complete circuit board design ready for manufacture. That means better circuits, designed orders of magnitude faster, at the fraction of the cost. Last year, we raised 1.5 million pounds to build this mission. In August, we developed the world's first commercial product that was designed autonomously by an AI. The results on your screen are era defining. Today, we're setting up projects with a plethora of engineering companies from multinationals, building cars and aircrafts, to small startups with just two guys in a lab experimenting on IoT devices. My co-founder and I are perfect to build this company because between his PhD in high performance alg algorithms and my experience building high integrity electronic systems for jet fighter pilots, we've mastered all the key ingredients required to solve this problem. Hardware is hard. You've probably heard that statement before. You've probably even said it yourselves. But what if there was a software company that could make hardware much, much easier to build? Dare to dream? Well, you can join our team, use our product, or invest. Just reach out to me. Every time you speak about your product, I'm just more and more in awe. It's just so incredibly cool. And you're really working, as you said, on stuff that is sort of era defining and it's sort of that next big leap. What inspires you? What inspires me? I think that I'm a nerd at heart. <laughs> um, I just love cool things. I love robots, I love spaceships, uh, we love autonomous vehicles, so many of these things. and. I just want to be part of um, the creation of the next generation of inventions. 
And one of the best ways to be part of that is be build something that can help build all of those things, not just one bit. So a bit greedy. So the impact that we're going to make is huge for me, um, for 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 what drives me and the the area in which we're working. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Congratulations on everything you're doing. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, thanks, Anita. All right. Well, if you thought that was already really complicated, well, we have more basically rocket scientists uh, joining us here today. Um, Osas and Isa are the founders of Deep Meta. Hi, I'm Osas Morgere, co-founder and CEO of Deep Meta. While most think the Iron Age is over, we know that it is stronger than ever. In fact, if you're sitting in a flat right now and are above the third floor, this is a miracle made possible by steel. It is so integrated into our society, we don't even realize that it's there. Yet 1.8 billion tons is produced globally every year. But 25% of steel made is wasted due to errors in production. And this leads to yield losses across the entire industry costing 25 billion pounds. The production of steel can be divided into four stages. From the making of molten steel in stage one, to the casting and rolling in stages two, three, and four. We are beginning with stages two and four as the most acute problems exist here. Breakout of molten steel during casting is catastrophic, leading to eight to 12 hours of downtime. As for finished products, customers are demanding ever higher requirements and charging penalties where these expectations are not met. However, machinery on production lines are already fitted with sensors that could solve these problems but the data is not being utilized. Our customers have told us that they are not sure where to start and are struggling to attract the right talent to solve this. Deep Meta software makes sense of the data and feeds back clear insights about the relevant product defects via existing human interface points, which you don't need to be a machine learning expert to make the most of. This provides operators, metallurgists, and with immediate access to information needed to reduce these defects. This is a market where 50 of the largest steel companies spend a collective 12 billion pounds on solutions. We are differentiated by a machine learning software specialized to metal. Alternatives in the market are either expensive hardware or generic AI providers. There is market validation in the form of a metals AI company, which raised a seed round of 2 million euros. However, their customer base has been limited to a single country. At six months old, we are already in three continents, and our customers are delighted. We're working with two of the world's top 10 largest steel companies and have the technological backing of Google for Startups to build our cloud architecture to deploy the software and cut CO2 emissions anywhere in the world. This is built for scale. Our team has an advantage in this space. We possess deep knowledge in metallurgy and machine learning supported by a highly respected thought leader in the industry. We are working to develop and remotely deploy an intuitive and robust software and grow to 14 customers in the next 18 months. This is why we are raising a seed round of 1.2 million pounds, seeking advisors and industrial clients. If you'd like to learn more, we'd be glad to continue this conversation with you. So get in touch with us at team at deepmeta.io and join us to save the world one ton at a time. Absolutely brilliant. Congrats, guys. Um, tell us, how has COVID-19 impacted the steel industry? And how has that affected you as a company? So for all, everyone in the world, um, the, the pandemic has led to a slowdown in the economy. And a lot of the steel manufacturers, customers are people like the automotive industry. And because less cars are being made, this has led to um, a slow in the demand for steel. As a result of this, um, this has meant that more than ever before, steel manufacturers need to be super lean with the way that they make their steel. If they're not, then they, and they're not selling as much as they usually do, this can really mess up the balance sheets. So what this is, how this has impacted Deep Meta, it's just meant that when we go to steel companies and we tell them about our proposition, they get it immediately. There's been a really quick, um, turnaround time between us interacting with them and them coming on board. Uh, and that's really helped to, to propel us. So I think we are founding Deep Meta at the perfect time in history.
Yeah, definitely. And I love the sort of double bottom line situation here where you a, you're saving money for, for these businesses, but also the, just the sustainability impact of what you're doing is, is absolutely fantastic. So thank you guys. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. And on the subject of sustainability, there is somebody else in our cohort, uh, this time based in France, uh, who can tell us a lot about how her startups can change the world. So over to Shirley. Hi. Do you know that 20 million tons of banana are discarded every year in the world just because they are ugly and single, like this one? It represents 20% of the annual production. It is huge, the equivalent of 2,000 Eiffel Towers. We are Cadalis, coming from French Caribbean, the sustainable beauty brand for committed people. Our mission is to recycle and valorize banana agro waste into patented organic active ingredients for beauty and food supplements. And at the same time, we give back to the local community and nature. We have a complete organic skincare line for all skincare concern. But for most of all, we have a committed brand deeply involved in finding solutions to reverse climate change by tackling food waste, by using green science to innovate with three patents around banana ingredients, green, yellow, and pink banana, by also sharing to create a social impact for local community. At Catalyst, we believe in inclusive capitalism to reduce inequalities, with 100% of the banana growers are shareholders of the company. We also educate women in science from French West Indies because we believe it will have a positive impact for the future. We are perfectly aligned with um, the trends um, of the beauty market and consumer expectation. Being green, being clean is not enough anymore. Now people want to buy blue, sustainable beauty and safe product, I mean efficient. The natural cosmetic market is growing very fast. It will represent more than $54 billion in 2027. Cadalis has a unique positioning among this clean brands ecosystem. We are one of the most blue and safe beauty brands, very sustainable and ethical and very efficient. And that is why our customers love Cadalis, because we are at the same time sustainable, ethical, effective, inclusive, and clean. In 2020, uh, 2020 was very positive for us. If despite the COVID, uh, we sold more than a half of million products in France. We won nine beauty awards as the best indie brand, as the best organic product, and we launched the brand in the US market. You can find currently our product online on our website uh, and partners uh, e-shops and also offline in retail uh, stores. That are the main partners that believe in us, well-known research center, the French banana industry, European public funds, the French overseas ministry, and our monitoring network, amazing network, um, uh, monitoring network, sorry, Google, L'Oreal, and Ignite for our US launch. So I'm Charlie Billot, founder of Cadalista. Our team is composed of young talents with expertise in biochemistry, marketing, and digital. At Canalis, we are also very, very, very bold. We want to spread the banana smile all over the world. And for that, we continue to raise funds to accelerate our growth. And especially for our next big challenge, entering the Chinese market. So now, are you ready to go bananas? Thank you. I think everyone is ready to go bananas. Um, thank you, Shirley. Congratulations. Merci bien. Ton entreprise est magnifique. Yes, <laughs> tell, like tell, us, um, tell us what's next for you in terms of product development. So we currently launch our new ingredients. It's a um, pink banana oil with amazing result. It's more efficient compared to argan oil. It's more 4,000 more efficient. Uh, in terms of antioxidant activity. This is this one. <laughs> and uh, we also have a part on uh, industry because we are working to build a, a plant in Martinique to directly transform the ugly bananas into uh, active ingredients. 
That sounds incredible. Thanks so much for joining us. Congrats on your business. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. All right, and we're coming back to the UK to hear from Elizabeth, the founder and CEO of Modularity Grid. Thank Hi, thanks, Martha. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, founder and CEO of Modularity Grid. Say you're in a lift. Then that chain that actually does the lifting breaks, okay? It's a terrifying thought. But a single innovation demonstrated in 1854 made lifts safe for people and kick-started an era of innovation that completely transformed the way buildings are constructed, enabling today's skyscrapers. That was a new automatic control feature that prevents lifts from falling. Microgrids are small scale energy systems made up of a combination of components that can generate, store, and distribute energy from any source at a fraction of the cost of extending these large traditional grids. Africa alone has an unmet need for 350,000 microgrids. It's a multi-billion dollar opportunity. So why are energy providers struggling to deploy more microgrids and still relying on diesel? Every microgrid is a tremendously sensitive and bespoke piece of tech with a high risk of failure. And also, when you're talking about renewable energy microgrids that rely in particular on complex pieces of tech like batteries, you find that they're even more difficult to handle and prone to failures that lead to power outages. And that is where we come in. Equipping energy providers with a novel set of digital tools that allow us to minimize downtime, save costs, and prolong the life of their microgrids by combining modularity with data and physics to bring down that complexity and consequently um, reduce the risks and costs that energy providers face when designing, setting up, operating, operating or even maintaining any microgrid. So similar to that automatic control feature that enabled today's skyscrapers and transformed our skylines forever. We are now leading a 1.5 million pound Innovate UK project to demonstrate our prototype with three of the biggest energy providers with the end goal of enabling them to deploy microgrids that can deliver affordable and renewable energy for homes, schools, hospitals, and businesses across Africa. But that is not all. In future, our technology can be adapted and applied to energy systems across multiple industries to keep up with the exponential rise in complexity. So if like us, you care deeply about climate change and have that burning passion to tackle some of the most difficult challenges of our time, whether you're an investor or an engineer, we would love to hear from you. Elizabeth, congratulations. You're on such an incredible mission and it still blows my mind to think that you've done something so, so powerful, but in a sense, so simple, sort of how to use technology that is both applicable for you know huge industries, for things like space travel, if you will, and then to really power those communities that, that, so, that so desperately need your products. Such a huge fan of what you're building. And we know that you won't be able to achieve all this if you don't have the best possible talent in the world. And we know that you're currently hiring. Tell us about who you're looking for and let's make sure that off the back of this showcase event, you get that talent. Absolutely, and thank you so much. So firstly, I think to everyone that's watching this, follow us on LinkedIn and like or share our posts so that we can get more views on our job posts uh, beyond our immediate networks. Um, that would absolutely be fantastic. So we're looking for an embedded software engineer. We're looking for um, pilot people with expertise in power electronics and data engineering. Um, and we're actively hiring immediately. And we'll be also adding up to eight roles to our team over the next um, 
six to eight months. Brilliant. I suddenly really regret I am not an engineer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, really congratulations. Massive fan of what you're building. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And now over to uh, Charles and Oyen, the co-founders of Move Me Back. Hi, we're Oyen and Charles, co-founders at Move Me Back, connecting talent with opportunity in Africa. We're an AI-enabled platform helping individuals and organizations unlock their potential through discovering new opportunities and new meaningful connections. And this was me, well, not actually me, five years ago, thinking about the possibility of working or building a business in Africa. There's so much potential, but the journey was not plain sailing. Africa has been the world's best kept secret and what we believe will be the epicenter of the fifth industrial revolution. By 2050, it's expected to be home to one in three of the world's workforce and have a market potential comparable to the US plus China combined today. Well, the numbers speak for themselves, but accessing this value and potential is hard, whether you're an African, member of the diaspora, startup or large organization. Through our own experience moving to pursue entrepreneurship in Africa, we found that access to talent and access to opportunity were the two biggest challenges holding back the continent's potential. On one hand, talent is untapped, with 25 million young people entering the workforce annually, and 50% of tertiary educated leaving to find opportunity abroad. Ironically, opportunity is equally untapped. Africa has just 10% of the management capacity it needs, and 70% of opportunities are informal. To solve this two-sided problem, we've created the LinkedIn for people and opportunities you don't know. You share your needs, interests, and expertise with the community. You get matched and discover new and informal opportunities, expertise, mentoring, jobs, experiences, then make meaningful connections and go on to collaborate with new people and new ideas and projects. And we're adding value. For the individual, we're breaking down the barriers to social and professional mobility. We're helping them to reach once hidden opportunities and make connections outside of their existing circles to scale their personal impact. And for the organization, we're enabling them to access curated high quality talent to scale teams, launch into new markets at record speed and build impactful brands. Now this value has been achieved with a new approach. The online professional world is optimized for helping us to connect with people and opportunities we already know. Take LinkedIn, for example, which incidentally only has less than 1% of their jobs in Africa. In a parallel world, online dating is probably the closest we've come to realizing the potential of discovering new people. Now Move Me Back sits at the cross section between these two worlds, professional discovery of new people and opportunities with a focus on Africa. And we've transformed the market. Over the last four years, we've become Africa's best known global talent community platform. We built a curated community of 50,000 in over 170 countries, driving 1.5 million opportunity engagements and interactions. We've supported over 500 leading organizations and hit our first 1 million revenue milestone. And we've done all of this without raising any funding so far. And we're just getting started. We have a global market potential of $1 trillion across recruiting, digital advertising, and professional training. We're starting with Africa, a $50 billion opportunity. And we've not done this alone. We've got a team across four continents. And as a co-founder duo, we've launched several startups over the last eight years. And we bring to bear 15 years of corporate experience with the likes of McKinsey, Accenture, and Goldman Sachs. So going forward, we're growing and we need help. We're scaling out technology, content and community teams, and we're looking for experienced leaders to join us. We're also raising our first investment round early next year, and we'd love to speak with you to tell you more about the world's best kept secret. Thank you. Absolutely incredible, guys. And I'm sure, first of all, if anyone from LinkedIn is watching this, if I were them, I would be worried. Or trying to acquire you guys pronto. Second of all, um, just the things that you're talking about is, you know, a million dollar in revenue without uh, raising any funding, the largest platform for the continent. 
share some tips on how did you build this business so big and so successful without fundraising? Because we know that bootstrapping is the way that many founders choose to go. Yeah, I, I think for us, thank you, Marta. I think for us, uh, we, we were ultimately always focused on the problem that we, we felt needed so solving. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we ourselves tried to move to the African continent and we found it very difficult doing so. And we realized that you know, whilst the narrative for many years had been that or ultimately the, the talent doesn't exist or there's no interest on the content, we actually found it to be the opposite. And so what we focused on was actually trying to understand where the problem lay. And we found that it was a transparency problem and an access problem. So our focus was always to think of how can we help individuals to access and see the opportunities which are there and they'll make those decisions for themselves. And that, be and that became something that people had a massive interest for. And similarly on the organization side, we found that organizations were trying to scale in the content and in some cases were looking for 18, 24 months before they could find the right talent. So we could bring the, the two worlds together and then we got nat natural growth from that. Yeah. And just to add, if I may, Marta, um, we started early on doing things that wouldn't scale. So we stayed really close to our customer, really close to the client um, and built a, a community where we were constantly asking for feedback and and, and um, to help iterate our products. And obviously that doesn't work with the level of scale that we're at now, but it really enabled us to get a really deep level of understanding and also to create customers and, uh, and uh, clients who became our best advocates and we're helping us grow organically just through word of mouth. Yeah, incredible. Congratulations, Guy, on what you're building. Congratulations on your up and coming investment round. I'm sure all investors on the call should be very keen to reach out. Brilliant. Oh, and Charles, thank you. And moving on to our next very exciting startup. So exciting, in fact, that even the producers of Whiskid are very interested in what they're building. So uh, Joel, Moses, Cyril, uh, Please join me, uh, Joel, representing New Fade. Thanks, Martha. Hi, I'm Joel. I'm the CEO and the co-founder of New Fade, and I'd like to introduce you to someone. This is Jeremiah. He's a dancer from London, and he's also one of our customers. He's been balding for the last nine years, and he's only 29 years old. He's felt ashamed, embarrassed, and insecure. And it's a story similar to mine, but we're not alone. 40% of men experience visible hair loss by the age of 35 years old. This equates to over 74 million men in the United Kingdom and the United States combined. Now, this is a market of over 12.9 billion by 2027, and it's continuing to grow all the time. Now, we believe it's a problem worth solving, and we're the right team to do it. We're a team of medical doctors and pharmacists with over 10 years clinical experience solving the healthcare needs of patients. And right now, we're going for hair loss. And our vision is to produce the world's first digital hair loss clinic by solving for stage appropriate solutions of hair loss. So those who are at risk of losing their hair, those who are in the early stages, and then those who are in the late stages of hair loss. So for early stage hair loss, we're currently building in stealth and we're leveraging cutting edge patented biotechnology to produce topical treatment solutions that have no side effects and are more effective than what's currently on the market. And for later stage solutions, which we've launched with, we're providing stylish, modern and undetectable hair pieces for men as a subscription-based service. So when a customer subscribes to NewFed currently, our pattern matching technology sends data to our African hair lab, which we now own as a part of a supply chain that produce and make the hair units that are appropriate for them. The hair is then applied in one of our micro clinics and then the customer leaves delighted as a new man. So we, we launched officially in September 2019 and we've been self-funded since. We've scaled to over 10,000 pounds monthly recurring revenue and we've, man we've managed to get to max capacity with that. Now we've seen over the last quarter over a thousand men try and sign up to New Fade. And because we're at max capacity, we've not served them yet but this represents unserved demand of over £1 million in annual recurring revenue. We've seen ourselves featured in Forbes, BBC Business. We even had clients try to fly in from overseas to use New Fade, and we've had demand from, every different, from different ethnicities, even though we started with black men. Now, we've seen celebrities come through the door as well, such as the video producer Wizkid and Davido and Premier League footballers, and we're just getting started. But why would anyone choose New Fade over current market incumbents? Well, in terms of outcomes, 
where it comes to new fade, every man succeeds. We don't just solve for hair loss, but we solve for hair loss with style, giving men the confidence they want and also leaving them without side effects. Now, remember Jeremiah? Confident, secure, and satisfied. That's New Fade's impact. We're raising one million pounds in Q2 of 2021 to provide safe and effective solutions for hair loss that are stage dependent. And we'd like to connect with UK and US-based investors, clinical researchers, and marketers. We'd love to hear from you. Incredible business. Con congrats, uh, congrats, Joel. And the impact of what you're building could be absolutely huge in just opening it up with 74 million men, the sort of immediate uh, addressable market opportunity. You talked about how you um, how you uh, have a product for sort of every stage from the biotechnology solution and earlier stages to, to later stage hair loss. Talk to us about scaling. How does it all scale? Clearly the demand is huge and you need to get there. Mm -hmm. So for us, we, we look at scale like this. Effectively, we're creating micro clinics within major cities where we can have numerous micro clinics that can serve people who are in the later stages of hair loss. For the earlier stages of hair loss and those who are at risk of losing their hair, we're working on topical treatment solutions powered by potentially stem cell technology that we can deliver directly to those consumers and they can see the wonders of what we have to provide with them. Sounds awesome. Thanks so much, Joel. Congratulations. And again, thank you for joining us today and joining us for the program. Uh, looking forward to seeing all the great links you get to. <laughs> thank you so much, Marta. Cheers. Thank you. And uh, moving on to Richard, the founder and CEO of Robin AI. Hi, everyone. I'm Richard Robinson. I'm the CEO and founder of Robin AI. And we're trying to make legal agreements better. See, the problem is that businesses all over the world, every time they sell their product or service, they have to agree a contract. And as someone who's been a lawyer for a very long time now, I can tell you, contracts are a nightmare. They're complicated. And that means someone with no legal training struggles to draft or edit or negotiate them without help. Lawyers are expensive. The average lawyer in the US and Europe is about 350 pounds an hour. So the cost of doing business is often just too high. And we often slow down the process. You know, lawyers performing simple, low complexity, manual tasks slows down the deal process and stops business from moving forward. That's why we created the Intelligent Contract Editing Service. It's a unique combination of artificial and human intelligence that simply edits your contracts. So imagine somebody sends you a contract and says, sign this. Well, rather than paying a law firm to edit it for you or spending hours of your own time going through it line by line, you can upload it to our platform and we'll use machine learning and human lawyering to edit it according to your preferences. It's an elegant solution that's having a really high impact. We've helped our customers cut costs by avoiding them having to pay law firms. We help turn documents around quickly, which means our customers get shorter sales cycles. And our work, because it's technically driven, is always consistent. So whenever you use Robin, you always get legal protection. We think that the legal services market is huge and it's ready for disruption. Last year, it was worth about 734 billion. And we think there are huge rewards available to whoever can bring some automation to drive down the cost of legal services. And we're approaching this problem in a really unique way. We have obsessed about our seamless onboarding experience and obsessed about making sure that we don't just flag things in contracts, we edit them for you. So someone with no legal training can use Robin confidently. So far, our customers agree with us that we're doing a good job. We've reviewed more than two and a half thousand contracts since we started. And since lockdown, we've seen a 150% growth in our revenue. So customers are enjoying the product. But we're just a team of legal engineers, machine learning engineers, and software engineers who are trying to build one of Europe's most diverse startups and are trying to make legal agreements a lot, lot better. 
So thank you for listening. If you want to help us out, there's two things you can do. The first is we're raising our seed round in January. So we'd love to have your help. Or if you're an investor interested in investing, please get in touch. And we're always looking for introductions to companies working in the M&A sector, which is where we've seen a lot of our success so far. Thank you for listening. Um, congrats, Richard. Really, really cool. And what, you know, I think many would agree that, that, that the legal space is definitely one that is ripe for technological advancements, uh, such as Robin AI, of course. Um, you talked a lot about happy customers. Um, tell us more about who finds your product most useful. Yeah, we found that everybody who hates doing simple contracts is enjoying using Robin. We, we give them a sense of relief. In the practical, practical sense, we're finding that the private equity market has been a great space for us. Financial institutions has been a great space for us. And generally startups who are receiving contracts, be they supplier agreements or contracts like dealing with leases, who just don't have the expertise to handle it themselves and maybe don't have the capital to pay expensive law firms to help. Sounds brilliant. Congratulations. Um, and best of luck. Thanks, Richard. And now, last but definitely not least, um, we've got Ivan uh, from Severa joining us to talk to us about his healthcare solution. Thanks, Marta. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. My name is Ivan Beckley. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Suvera. So the problem for us that we're trying to solve is actually this position where long-term conditions affects a third of the UK population. So there are 26 million people who have a long-term condition they need to manage every single day. The majority, 99% of these patients are managed in appointments, which are often infrequent. They're ineffective. They're limiting, they're limited of care, and they lack continuity. So our solution today that we're coming to market with is an opportunity to actually have long-term conditions managed in a long-term way. So having more frequent, continuous reviews with patients in a way that's simple. Our product is deadly simple, sustainable, in that it can manage over a long period of time and scalable in that the increasing number of patients that are being managed can do so on the platform. So today we're building a support service for long-term care. So we work with general practices across the UK and we enable them to streamline care through the application. So we know exactly what needs to be done. We have an infrastructure with the application, as you can see, and we have a community that's local and curated. The idea here is to create a virtual long-term care that's continuous for every patient. So our comparison to the system is that actually our intention is to save time and improve quality. That's really the focus of what we're trying to do. The market opportunity is huge. So 5.5 billion pounds is spent every year to manage these 26 million people in long-term conditions and appointments. And we think actually half of this isn't necessary. I am actually a student doctor finishing my medical degree in a couple of months. I see these appointments. I'm there, I'm in these consultations. Most of these aren't necessary and what we're trying to do is to streamline that. The market position for us is to sit in the place where actually it's more continuous and it's patient supported. We think that's a big differentiator to the, to the current market players who are more discontinuous and they're more like forms and surveys and they're not supporting the patient. So currently we have over 3,000 patients that are registered across a few practices managing on Suvera. And we're in the process of really increasing that and more than double that in the next few months. And that's really a testament to actually how important this product has been in the market. So our team is, is, is primed to be able to deliver this. As I mentioned, I'm a student doctor in a couple months finishing my medical degree. I was previously at DeepMind working on AI research. And that helps us as a team to be able to focus and make sure that we deliver a product that is of value and actually has the ability to create the value that we know for patients and doctors. We also have advisors across the system. So David Stables recently um, left EMIS, which is the largest electronic health record in the UK. Stephen is one of the investors in the company and actually runs the second largest pharmacy in the UK and the fastest growing. So we have a set of advisors to position the company 
Already, as I said, we've launched our first version of the application. We're managing patients on the platform that's safe to do so. We're closing a few of our trials and working to integrate into the platforms. So the next few months are, are some of the biggest opportunities for us. So we're currently closing our two to three million C round, which is already more than halfway through. Um, so we're in the last few months. And so what we're asking for is individuals who want to join our journey to build the future of healthcare, which is more driven virtually, more continuous and more supportive of the patient. Thank you all for listening. It's just been great to be here. Thanks so much, Ivan, and congrats. And what a way to finish off our pitch today. Um, <laughs> yeah. really, really well done. Um, Ivan, you, um, any any of the health tech founders, especially in the UK, have felt the pain or the, or the challenge, as well as the opportunity of working closely with the NHS. Um, this is yeah. something that you have done really successfully. Tell us how. Yeah. Well, I think it starts from being trained in the NHS. So, you know, we come to the table not as just businessmen or individuals, or businessmen and women, or just techies. We come as people who have trained and are clinicians. And so that helps because we know the problem, we've experienced it. And also in that we position ourselves with advisors who understand the system. Healthcare is one of those where you can't just walk in with a blank sheet with no awareness. We walk in with a huge amount of context, awareness, and that helps us to move forward with contracts and opportunities in a way that's very difficult for other startups and companies to do. Yeah, brilliant. Ivan, thank you so much. Thanks Congrats, Sarah. Well. Cheers. Uh, listen, everyone, I don't know how you're feeling, but my face hurts from smiling. Um, it's such an incredible, incredible afternoon. And it's only getting better because we've just heard from 11 incredible startups that are sort of in this pre-Series A stage. But we want to show that black founders around the world are achieving tremendous success. And we will be hearing from two of the most incredible ones. So I'm so excited to announce the exclusive fire chat between uh, Shola Akinlade, who is the CEO and co-founder of Paystack, a fintech company from Nigeria that was famously referred to as the Stripe of Africa, and then to the delight of the whole ecosystem, got acquired by Stripe just a few months ago. Um, joined by Nova Abakara, COO and co-founder of SIFT, um, an online marketplace for providing flexible work for job seekers in industry such as hospitality, light industrial or facilities management. Uh, and uh, his company, SIFT, was acquired by Indeed a couple of years ago. And they will be interviewed by the wonderful Amy Lewin, the deputy editor of SIFTED. So Shola, Nova, Amy, please join our virtual stage. Hello. Yeah, hi, everyone. So hi, as everyone. Everyone said, this is just super interesting to actually hear for some founders who have sold their businesses, which, you know, I think for a lot of people listening is sort of seems like a very far off thing and, and quite a kind of mystical thing to hear about. Um, so what I'm going to try and milk out of you in the next uh, 20 minutes is kind of, you know, what, what it's actually like and how you kind of got your business to a point where someone, you know, and some pretty impressive companies actually wanted to give you money for them. Um, so maybe you could start by kind of setting the scene. So where kind of were your companies at, at the point when you started thinking about selling or when, you know, these conversations kind of started? Nova, do you want to go first? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I mean, when we got acquired or when they approached us, we weren't thinking about selling at that point at all. Um, we did think potentially in the next two years or so, we may get approached, um, but we didn't for a second, think for a second we'd be selling in 2019, having just launched in 2015. Um, we were actually in the middle of raising our Series B funding um, with a VC and we had a term sheet, everything was signed, DD was done. Um, we're at like sort of green contract stage and indeed who were trying to get into the round sort of did a 180 and decided they'd rather acquire us. And then we had this sort of big risky decision to make of like saying no to like 12 million pounds of Series B capital and going down the risk of failing DD down the acquisition route. Um, we obviously went down the acquisition route now. In hindsight, we don't regret it one bit, um, but it was a big decision for us at the time. Um, um, and then, yeah, as things transpired, um, you know, we we met them in Austin, Texas. Uh, they promised us the world essentially that we'd have autonomy. They've everything they promised has come true, um, and it's just yes, yeah, it was a it was an interesting process for us. 
Okay, we'll drill into that a bit in a second. But so how how big was your team maybe at that point? And you've been we, going for what, four years? Yeah, we were a team of around 79, 80 people, I think it was oh. roughly, uh, across sort of uh, six cities because we need operations around, you know, local to where we, we launch. Um, so been going for four and a half years, had raised around sort of 10 million in capital at that point. Um, yeah. Amazing. And Shola, what about you? Kind of where was the business at, at, the, at that kind of stage for you? Yeah, um, well, let me just say um, it's been very good just like watching all the pitches. Like I'm really, really, really excited just like by the future that is being built. So um, congrats to everyone. Um, I think for us, uh, we have about 118, 120 people on the team. Um, yeah. And yeah. And were, you, and were you kind of, were you actually thinking at that point? now's the time to sell the business or was it the same as novo it kind of yeah, came it, it very, very similar i think like paystack we were, were trying to like figure out how to make payments work in the continent and we've spent the last five years actually just figuring that out um stripe invested in our series a so we had a relationship with them already for two years and so it was just like a natural progression of a relationship that you know like we had started working with their teams um, our roadmaps are very similar. Um, and it was just very obvious that um, having access to Stripe's resources will help us scale faster. Um, yeah, because I think for me personally, like the reason I wake up every morning is just to figure out how to make uh, payments and commerce work in the continent. Okay, and how, how do you kind of think through the pros and cons? You know, imagine this is a bit like a deal or no deal as in the yeah. game show situation, you're like, do I take the money that's on the table here or do I kind of go for this other vision? You know, what's, what's some useful ways of thinking through those pros and cons? Yeah, one of the very things I heard in the beginning of the journey was that companies are bought, not really sold, you know, like it's hard to like, Paystack was not for sale, you know, um, it's hard to just say, oh, my company's for sale. Like that's, you don't want to be there. <laughs> So the first thing is not to really think about it because that's not your work. Like your work is to build a very strong business, a very valuable business, a very like, you should just focus on your ambitions and do what you want to do. Um, and along the way, if you find the right partner and if it makes sense, you know, as a founder, you know, you have to be resourceful. You have to do what it takes uh, to get your business where it needs to get to. Um, feel free to like have the conversations. But I think is the, the biggest principle I want people to remember is that companies are bought, not sold. And, and Novu, how do you think, do, you know, is there is there anything about how you kind of grow the business that, you know, you do slightly differently to make it attractive to be bought? Or is it just the same principles as just, growing a good business that yeah. will be good to its employees and hopefully make some money. <laughs> I think um, it's, it's a bit like what Shola said. Um, you know, we were always in the PR. We, had, we always were in, like, in the media. We had a lot of PR. We had some high-profile investors. And we can point to sort of shouting loudest, got us exposed. But, I mean, the truth of the matter is we, we were the biggest and most successful one in the UK and potentially Europe. And so, you know, by focusing on execution and listening to our users and, uh, and sort of delivering and solving their problems, um, it got us to that stage. It wasn't a matter of we were thinking of, we need to look like this to be acquired. Um, don't get me wrong, throughout the raising process, we brought in lawyers to make sure we were ready for anything, any big investment or any big acquisition. Like our, you know, when we went through DD stage, there was no skeletons in our closets per se. Um, so like we did that sort of level of due diligence, but in terms of the day-to-day -day running the business, it was just, we want to scale, we want to make this impact, let's focus on that. And if we do these things, naturally everything else will fall into place, whether it be investment or people looking to acquire you. What do you think was the, the if there is even one, like the single most attractive thing about your both of your companies for the for the companies that acquired them? You know, what 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 made them sign that check? <laughs> Novo? Um, I mean, for us, I mean, it's a very, very specific detail, but um, we were in a very, very competitive space. Yeah, everyone was trying to be Uber for staffing, leverage technology to change what is a 400 billion, uh, 400 billion you know, global market. And we had achieved uh, a contract with what was the fifth largest contract caterer in hospitality, uh, where we were sole supplier. Um, and, and we delivered that through creating a bespoke SaaS platform, which no one else had done, which essentially 
was a Trojan horse. We became the desktop for our clients' sort of staffing needs internally and it connected to our marketplace. And off the back of that, we became sole supplier for this huge company. And that achievement separated us from literally everyone else globally. You know, Indeed, it looked at everyone globally. And that achievement was a significant milestone for us, which really elevated us above the pack. Okay, Shoda, did you have something like that as well? Like something that, is that it? You need to have the one thing that no one else can offer. Um, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I guess I'll have to ask Stripe. But I think from my side, some of the things I can, my best guess um, and some of the things I've heard is that um, our ability to execute independently was really cool because like Paystack is Paystack, you know, Paystack will continue to be Paystack and Paystack already has its leaders, has the right team, has the right customers and we, we will continue to scale Paystack across the continent. So I think it wasn't as if, oh, they were acquiring like a liability or a company that they have to like spend a lot of time trying to get to where it needs to be. So I think one thing that really helped us was just like, like we'll just do our thing, you know, <laughs> we can do our thing and we can continue to do what we're doing. Uh, yeah, so it, it felt very, very like win-win for everybody. So how do you, you know, VCs love that expression of kind of like a founder VC relationship is like a marriage and I'm always like, oh, don't don't give me this. But how, I mean, being acquired like that is a serious thing you're entering into. How do you kind of really figure out whether these people are, you know, going to be going to be good for your business? And also, I guess, kind of not not stick to their word, because obviously you sign contracts, but kind of give you the freedom or you know the space to run your business still uh you know as as you want to because I think a lot of people think once businesses are sold that's kind of like it you're like off doing some gardening or something but you know you're not you're still you're still there growing this thing yeah um okay maybe I can start I think the first part of it is just not making compromises you know, like you can't say oh you pick the highest bidder for your company and then you expect things to work out well, you know? So I think for us, it was just like, it wasn't as if, like we didn't run a process. We didn't try to say, oh, we have an offer from Stripe. Let's ask other people. And then, you know, like it wasn't about that because that would have actually created that position where we would have gotten someone else and maybe they would like come in and then new things will come up. But mm -hmm. for us, it was just like, a partnership that had evolved for over two years. They had invested in us. Uh, we had, and they had even trusted us, you know, like they led our uh, series A, you know, and the terms were very founder friendly. They trusted us with a lot already as investors. So of course, like it, there was that trust and it was, it was, it, that was the basis uh, about the decision from my side. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense. So if you've, obviously you're in a stronger position to assess those things, if you've already been working with the company as an investor for, for a while. Nova, do you have anything to add on kind of how to scope uh, your potential acquirer? <laughs> unfortunately, I didn't have, we didn't have the luxury of having known Indeed for a long time. You know, we met them in December. We signed our term sheet for Series B in December. And by February, they were telling us they want to acquire us. And so in that sort of month and a half of getting to know them, um, they just really had convinced us, essentially. They sold very, very hard uh, to me and my co-founder in terms of what it looked like. Um, you know, they flew us over to Austin, Texas. They flew their like 12 of their senior leadership over to the UK to meet us, meet our team and spend a lot of time with us. And just seeing that effort that they put in, it sort of gave us the comfort that, okay, they, what they're saying, they'd have to be lying immensely to pivot <laughs> from what they're saying. And I like to think people aren't that sort of, um, what's what I'm looking for, uh, mischievous. Um, okay. So like, they just, you know, they just gave us the comfort that, you know, we're gonna let you guys run as you want. Um, we're just gonna support you as much as possible. Um, and, you know, now we've done that, we have more autonomy now than when we had VCs on our board. Um, so they, they've been really true to their word. That's interesting. I'm not sure people would also think through that, that you kind of have, this is an alternative to VCs kind of sitting on your board and suggesting things every few months. Shona, I have a question from the audience, which is, did you plan to be acquired by Stripe? And were there any telltale signs? You know, did they start flirting about uh, acquisition? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I did plan to be acquired by Stripe. Um, when, when we say Paystack is a Stripe for Africa, um, it's usually just for clarity, you know, like 
a lot of people and going to Silicon Valley, we had to pitch face like a lot of times. Like I must have pitched face like maybe like 200 or 300 times. So I didn't want to have to cram anything. I didn't want to have to remember anything. So the simplest way to pitch face like is like Stripe for Africa. Yes, exactly. So I think it was it was a very simple way to pitch face that and, and it caught on very quickly. So uh, that was it. That said, I also had a, a crush on Stripe. You know, I checked their documentation, their product. Like, I looked at everything they were doing, and it was just like the perfect inspiration for building Paystack. But I knew that the Paystack mission, even though it was very similar to Stripe's mission, had to be executed like as as it is. You know, like as. That's why I'm here, you know, that's why I have to work. So it wasn't really about getting acquired by Stripe. It was more about just doing what we really wanted to do. Do you, for any founders, I know we've, we've spoken about you want to get your business into a position where it's kind of so good or there are elements of it that are working so well that someone, you know, another company would actually want to buy it. But if someone is in the position where they kind of want to sell their business, do you have any advice for, for anyone listening? Nova? Yeah. Um, it's a difficult one because I think like Shola said, you never you never sell what you're bought. And people looking to sell are usually selling because they're looking to get out or something. So they're not going or progressing the way they wanted. Um, so it's quite hard to say, you know, if you're looking to sell, um, you just have to be very crystal clear in your message and the problem you're solving. A bit like when you're looking to get investment. You really need to crystallize the problem that, you know, to the potential acquirers or investors. Uh, and how your solution is is a thing that's going to solve it and add on top of that make sure the problem you're solving is attractive enough that it's worth them investing in you guys to solve it um, a lot of uh, people have great ideas uh, and solutions without actually crystallizing the problem they're actually addressing and sort of how big that problem is um, and so i'd say if you can really crystallize that messaging uh, you'll you'll get attractive uh, in, from investments and uh, acquirers pretty quickly Amazing. And then we need to close off in a moment. But Shola, any advice then for someone who maybe they're at kind of seed or series A now and they are wanting to get their company position where it will be bought in the future? <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe I'll answer that first question and then close it with this one. I think the first question around like if you are in a position where you want to sell, how would you do? I would say that a lot of founders, like being a founder is like very lonely because they get a lot of advice from different places and even from random people on the internet. So <laughs> it's ex extremely important to look inwards. Like, what do you want? And it's fine. Like Shola and Novo have said, like companies are bought, not sold. But if you want to sell your company, sell it, man. Just do what you <laughs> want to do. Like look inward and do what makes you happy because starting a company is building your own dreams. You know, a lot of people, the mistake founders make, especially when you have venture funding, is that you 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 confuse it. Like, am I building the investors' dreams or are the investors like helping me build my dreams? You know, so don't mix it up. It's your dreams and people are helping you build your dreams. It's not vice versa. So I think having that clarity helps you at the point of making the decision. Um, as to what to do to prepare for it, um, I think Novo made a good point about like not having skeletons in your cupboard. Because the truth is that for someone to give you a lot of money for a lot of value, they're going to check for skeletons. They're literally, and they're professionals. <laughs> they're the best professionals to check for skeletons. Like, if there's a skeleton, trust me, it will be found. Except you want to lie. Well, you don't want to lie too much too, because one day it will still be found. So I think. Just being really like pure about the kind of company you're building, being very transparent, knowing that whatever you do, uh, someone is going to ask questions one day, and you know, just just do the right things. I guess that's the way to summarize it. Build your company the right way. Do the right thing. No compromises. Build your own dreams. You know, and just do your thing. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. That's the kind of sum up I should do, but you've just done it for me. So thank you very much. Thank you guys. We need to close off now, but thank you so much for all those insights. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Wow. Um, Amy, Charlotte, Novo, they were absolutely incredible. And 
Wow, I think something a good a good maybe segue to connect this is um, about the powers of programs like the one that you were just concluding today and 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 the founders they've heard from. Um, actually, Paystack is an alum is an alumni organization from GFS Accelerator, formerly known as Launchpad, from a few years ago. So I'm really happy to to know that Google played a little part in, in, in this incredible success and that we continue um, supporting founders like, like Shola and like Novo and like the ones that you've heard from today. Um, well, my heart is full, it, it really is. But um, the, work, the, work doesn't, the work doesn't stop here. Obviously, we will continue working with, with these founders at Google for Startups. And there is a number of commitments that we've made that you've heard from us about already. So there's obviously the Black Report, and we want to continue supporting the Black Report. There's the continued support for the founders that you've met today. There is the uh, Google Black Founders Fund in Europe that we are planning to distribute in Q1 next year, and we'll be announcing um, we'll be announcing applications for. So please stay in touch with the Google for Startups team. Uh, you know, check out our newsletter and our social media now. The responsibility is not only on us, the responsibility is on everybody to make sure that we create a more inclusive, better for everyone tech ecosystem. So if you are, you know, if you're a startup person, continue supporting the companies that you've seen today. If you're an investor, give these founders their money. Trust me, it's going to be in good hands. You've seen the caliber of talent we saw today. If you work in a corporate, Talk to your leadership. You know, I'm so proud that Google did the right thing by both starting the fund, running these programs. Every organization can ship in, and together we can really make that change and be that change that we want to see in the world. I, I couldn't thank you enough for joining us for this event today. I could not thank enough the incredible Google for Startups team that made it possible. So we've heard the shout outs already, but massive shout out to Andy Watts, who's been running the tech for this entire quite complex event. Um, huge thank you to the program team, Mariano Bumanjal, Oliver Turnbull. Thank you to Michael Kavanaugh, Anika Henry. Um, thank you to um, Rachel Palmer, who worked tirelessly on the Black Founders Fund. Thank you to our leadership. I, I could go on, but um, uh, there's this beautiful African proverb that it takes a village. Um, we're hopefully starting a little village. Uh, thank you for everyone that joined this event today. Thank you for our support for us and our founders. Have an excellent afternoon. Speak to you soon.